Due date for uh, op -eds. Actually, I said this in the class, but some of you might have been missing. So, the due date, the deadline for op -ed submission is December 17th. op -ed. due date, December 17th. And the simulation will take place on December 21st because it's a, it is a Tuesday, like today, and we will start at 10.30, and this room will, will be available, and I will make necessary arrangements uh, by coming earlier or maybe a day before. Um, I don't know if there's any class before us just uh, on Tuesday mornings. But we will start at 10.30 and of course there will be intermissions every 50 minutes and we might have to continue for a third hour until 1.30 or 1.20 something like that, I mean in the afternoon. So uh, on, on Fridays we have only one hour and actually we have slots for two hours, but uh, simulation might last longer, so it is better if we had the simulation on December 21st. All right, so please mark your agendas about these two important dates, and also let your friends know about this, because some of you, uh, I mean, may not have been here in previous sessions, and some of your friends, as far as I can see, actually are missing here. All right, and you have to coordinate with your peers, or teammates, that there will be a simulation. And most likely, on December 17th, uh, I may give you some hints, or we may even uh, uh, have a rehearsal. I mean, just maybe try to figure out as to what uh, actually you will be doing here during the simulation, all right? So this December 17th, deadline, the due date for op-ed submissions, late submissions will not be accepted, and the simulation December 21st. Right. So, uh, any questions? And I will give the exams during the break, not now, and also after the class. And we will continue with uh, the PowerPoint slide that we sort of stick to which I have uh, quite I find quite interesting and useful for discussing many of the issues that are actually being discussed today. Oops. So um, we stick to this PowerPoint slide not because we don't have any other PowerPoint. Of course we do have, and I might prepare, as I said before, uh, other PowerPoints, but this is uh, important in the sense that we are not going as fast as I did actually while presenting this PowerPoint back in November 2006 at NATO school, and the whole presentation lasted for about 50 minutes. And actually, as I said, uh, it was the best presentation chosen by the participants among some 30 plus other presentations at the NATO school. This is something important. Um, but the reason why it takes so long is that I sort of uh, spent enough time for covering every single issue that I've mentioned here in bullet points. And of course, I make this comparison between today and past and the past, like 2005, 2006, and even before. And there are many issues which are, of course, revolving around the Iranian nuclear program. I mean, if you look at the WikiLeaks, you see there the Iran's nuclear program as to who said what, I mean, which king or sheikh or, I don't know, uh, uh, prime minister or um, president of which country said what about Iran's nuclear program and everything. And by the way, uh, I don't know if you follow this scandalous development, the WikiLeaks leaking uh, secret files, which were supposed to be secret or confidential, 
But um, uh, this is something that, in a sense, confirms uh, something that I used to say at the beginning of every single semester that I'm teaching here, I mean, since 1997. There is a huge gap between what people say and what people do in the international arena, in the political circles, in the major circles as well. So nothing is what it seems to be or what you see. So it is important to understand that there is, a, uh, there is this huge gap and therefore we cannot rely on what people say but we have to rely on what they actually do and since or in the absence of information about what they have done actually, of course we have to figure out what may have uh, happened in the past and we, we do this by relying on the past information or, of course which could be evidence, which could be substantiated with facts, figures, documents or archival uh, information etc. So that's why international relations experts must work on the archives, documents, primary sources which are revealed to public scrutiny, I mean for, for research. Of course until WikiLeaks uh, it took about 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, depending on the level of secrecy of the document. And for, for instance, uh, if you go and read my article, which is published in um, Middle Eastern Study, I guess, uh, Iran's nuclear program and Western, uh, Iranian nuclear ambitions and Western countries stand something like that. I can't remember the exact title. And there I have referred to a number of archival stuff which I retrieve from the National Security Archives of the United States as to who said what or what kind of communication took place between for instance the US Embassy in Tehran and the Washington the State Department and what kind of directives were sent to the uh, ambassador in Tehran from Washington by the State Department or by the President or what kind of um, negotiations or discussions may have taken place between the Shah of Iran and the President of the United States, um, uh, I don't know, um, Kennedy or uh, his followers, etc. So, Johnson, uh, Ford. Uh, so, therefore, uh, it is important to bear in mind that as international relations experts or scholars, we are dealing with actually with certain illusions and uh, we are not necessarily able to have access to all the real-time uh, uh, tangible verifiable data at all times so therefore it is our task to familiarize ourselves with the typical behavior of states and in some cases specific behavior of particular states and by basing our analysis on this uh, information that is available based on what we sort of uh, I get from reliable sources, we can only construct a certain degree of analogy and make a kind of a guessing, uh, uh, some sort of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe hypothesizing about what may have happened or what may be happening. So it is indeed a very difficult thing to be an international relations scholar. If you're a professional, I mean, if you're a military professional, a military officer, or a diplomat, or a bureaucrat in some of the ministries, you have access to a certain, of course, limited, depending on your level, access to real information, which is not, of course, uh, uh, disclosed to other people. So you cannot have access as, as a scholar unless you have the permission to do so. I think I said this uh, on one occasion, but let me repeat. When I was writing my doctoral dissertation on uh, nuclear non-proliferation regime, I was curious about uh, the policy of uh, the Turkish Republic, the Turkish government, and some institutions such as the military. I applied to the Turkish general staff with a letter written by my supervisor, then Alikar Osmanol, and we made this application, formal application, to have access to certain uh, information and library, whatever documents they may have. Well, we received the answer couple of years later after I earned my PhD? And the answer was no. We will not allow you to make research. Thank you. I did my dissertation, my, my work already, which was found successful. So therefore, this, there are many limitations in front of us. Well, actually, this WikiLeaks uh, may provide a lot of substantial information for the researchers, not only for journalists, but also for the scholars. 
as to what may have happened in the recent past or what may be happening today, and what are these sort of uh, informations that are revealed a point at for the future? I mean, what kind of developments are likely to take place in the future? You might remember that I was talking about uh, the unease, the, 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 the lack of, or, or the degree of discontent in the Gulf countries. But, I mean, some of you uh, had said, I can't remember who, well, sir, but, you know, Ahmadinejad had just paid a visit to Saudi Arabia. Does this mean that they have good relations? Of course, on the face value, when you look at the screens of TVs or whatever, uh, newspapers, uh, you see pictures shaking hands, smiling at each other. Well, this is how it is uh, at the face value, but behind the doors, they, of course, not necessarily exchange similar feelings about each other, and, and especially behind closed doors when they talk about uh, their enemies or the, the threats that they perceive when, with the United States or with other Western countries, they expect the United States and Western countries to do something, of course, which they don't uh, reveal to the public. So this kind of uh, issues are actually at the core of uh, the limitations of the uh, interna international relations scholars. And to overcome this difficulty, it is always useful and in the, indeed it is essential it is a sine qua non thing for international relations scholars to look into the archival data. I mean, what sort of, uh, what kind of developments have really taken place 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago? Sometimes information may be uh, disclosed to public scrutiny much earlier than many people expect. And sometimes you, for instance, uh, I remember uh, again during my research at the United U.S. National Security Archives, you get a, a sort of document. You, I mean, you get the message that you have the docu document is available. You say, wow, I got it. Then you have the full document with maybe a couple of sentences left without any uh, sort of uh, blank or everything. So they still erase much of the information, names, places, dates, etc. And as such, the document may not be of much use for, for your research. So anyway, uh, it is something that uh, this field, as I always said, not only this semester, every single semester that I started teaching here uh, to my students, in order to emphasize the value of reading about the past. Because as I said last Friday, you do not necessarily seem to be happy with reading information or um, commentary, or data, whatever, about past events. You want to discuss today and this is not a pop culture issue. International relations is a very serious business, and it, has, it deals with people's lives. It affects people's lives. And what you do as a professional as well as a scholar has to be, of course, uh, very seriously decided. So this is therefore important. And uh, the, the most recent developments, the WikiLeaks and everything, uh, <coughs> tells, uh, tell us again how important it is to know about what exactly is happening. So therefore, here uh, we will see uh, information about uh, what, in my opinion, and based on my research, uh, is uh, exactly happening in, with respect to the uh, Iran's nuclear program. I think I, we had covered this part, and we had come to the United States, I guess, and uh, yeah, I mean, we had started already. Um, we may be just uh, repeating some of certain things, but it's not a big deal. We'll still continue. Uh, we emphasize that Iran constitutes a, a threat. Actually, back in 2006, it was a potential threat. Now, Americans, uh, uh, security experts, not only from the government, but also from academia, uh, from journalistic circles, they emphasize this as a clear threat. And not only the United States, but also, as you have seen and we have heard about over the last couple of uh, days, uh, countries in the Gulf, uh, uh, and as well as uh, Israel, and even Turkey. Uh, at some point, I just had a, a quick glance at uh, some of the uh, documents which were leaked and uh, reporting the conversation between Phil Gordon and uh, Ahmed Davutoglu. And Phil Gordon is trying to sort of uh, 
uh, influence Ahmed Davutoglu's opinion that his, I mean, Davutoglu's initiatives with respect to, you know, this uh, swap deal, nuclear exchange, um, exchange of nuclear uh, low energy uranium, nuclear material, will not serve anything, will not uh, go anywhere. Uh, actually, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, is taking place between Davutoglu and Phil Gordon, and he's trying to uh, tell, uh, tell, tell his Turkish counterpart that this is not going to go anywhere, but this is not going to help. And Davutoglu uh, sort of sticks to his own opinion, that, and he emphasizes that this is something that may be useful. As I mentioned here uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, and also have written about it, the swap deal between Turkey, Iran, and Brazil, which was signed on May 17th uh, this year, uh, earlier this year, uh, is maybe, if not the only, but one of the most important breakthroughs which uh, has taken place over the last several years when this issue came to the fore uh, more uh, uh, intensively. So, uh, sorry for all this. Um, so, there we see uh, the United States pursues a policy uh, which, is, which I decided or just label as stick only policy. There is this term carrots and sticks. As you are most probably aware, this is something that is used in the uh, diplomatic jargon, carrots and sticks. And some people don't like this term and they say we are not uh, animals, so why should we be you know, uh, given incentives with carrots or why should we be punished by sticks? But this is the ter this part of the terminology, jargon, use, etc. And the United States policy was, as I put it here, stick-only policy. So the United States expected Iran to take certain steps first and then maybe uh, considering some uh, favors, some, some benefits, that is some carrots. Not necessarily carrots first and sticks uh, uh, first and then uh, if, if Iran uh, live up, lives up to its uh, commitments then some carrots might follow. That was the United States policy which in my opinion has not changed dramatically. There is a slight change in the attitude especially with the change of government in the United States. Bush has gone and Obama came to power and as we have seen he sort of uh, uh, about uh, this time uh, last year, in actually er in early October and uh, which uh, continued a little bit into the uh, November last year, there was a, a certain uh, amount of diplomatic uh, negotiations between Iran, of course Iranian representatives, and uh, the representatives of P P5 plus 1. You know this term, P5 plus 1, the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany. And as such, actually Germany has made itself into another big power, which was a long-term ambition of German uh, diplomats, uh, or just German politicians. Uh, because I'm sure they envy very much the uh, UK's and French's, uh, French positions as P5, uh, members of P5 and Germany, which used to be a much more economically, maybe even militarily and politically stronger country than when compared to the UK and, uh, and France. Why they, they, they keep asking why they are not there. Of course, they do not ask this loudly, so you, you may not hear, but we, we understand from their sort of uh, statements, uh, stance, uh, positions in some international developments. Anyway, uh, we mentioned again last time that the United States has a limited economic diplomatic leverage. So actually, the United States lacks uh, a number of mechanisms that might be useful in bringing Iran to terms from their perspective. So, I mean, by applying stick-only policy, I mean, by sort of uh, threatening Iran only without providing any incentives or any encouragements or any tangible benefits in return for anything that Iran might 
do, then of course, if, if the United States does not have these mechanisms or does not have this capacity, of course, um, it will not be possible from the United States perspective to, to establish a, a sort of a certain degree of communication that might be fruitful, that might be, uh, that might provide uh, certain uh, tangible results. So, therefore, uh, it is, uh, it is, the United States has difficulties and that's why even though the United States complained uh, very much about a European Union's intervention, which I said after the revelations of the uh, uh, coming from the uh, opposition group, the uh, Mujahideen Halk, Halk Mujahid theory, uh, whose headquarters now in, uh, uh, is in Washington, and they back in August 2002 they. they sort of uh, reveal information about the presence of this Natanz nuclear facility. And uh, then Mohammed al baradei went to Tehran uh, and asked for certain uh, clarifications about the allegations of a secret enrichment facility. And of course, based on what he, he got or what he did not get from the Iranians, uh, he, uh, in early 2003, he um, issued an ultimatum and a statement, he made a statement and uh, asked Iran to sign the additional protocol, the enhanced uh, verification mechanism, verification uh, inspection document of the IAEA by October 31st, 2003. And by that time, the European Union countries, uh, United Kingdom, France, and Germany, have taken the initiative to convince the Iranians that it would be in their best interest to sign the additional protocol. What is interesting about the addition protocol, that this might be a little bit repetition for those who listen to this part, but uh, again, still useful to refresh your minds. And for those who have not been here just uh, to understand the significance of addition protocol, it is, uh, it is the document according to which the International Atomic Energy Agency conducts or carries out inspections in, in countries. There is, as we mentioned before, the model protocol coming from 1970-71, the updated version, which is InfCERC information circular, uh, which is a, a internal sort of uh, documentation on uh, recording number of the IAEA. There is this additional protocol Actually, it is 98, and there are certain uh, updates in well, 40, 540. These are not important things uh, for those who are not particularly interested. But this is obligatory for every MPT, non-nuclear weapon state. Non-nuclear weapon states, party to the MPT, must sign uh, or must conclude a safeguards agreement with the IAEA based on this model protocol. This is obligatory. But since it was uh, concluded in 1970, 71, based on certain concerns of a number of countries, such as Japan, Germany, who did not want to be subject to extensive verifi uh, verifi inspections, which they considered would cause some disadvantages uh, commercially, economically, as well as uh, other concerns. Um, this model protocol was not a very strong document. And according to this model protocol, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency could visit um, the nuclear facilities that are declared by the states. And even if the IAEA had some sort of intelligence from various sources, which, by the way, IAEA could not then rely on anybody's intelligence, it was forbidden. But somehow, let's assume, this is a country, and there are these nuclear facilities in this country, but the authorities have only declared these three, but left this one out. The IEA, even if they knew about it, they could not go there, because they had to rely on the declaration made, initial declaration made by the host country, an MPT member country, and the inspections had to be carried out according to model protocol. And even then, in these facilities, it could go only to specific uh, designated area. It could not go everywhere in the facility. 
So this model protocol was a relatively very weak document. So after some the revelations of uh, Iraqi nuclear capabilities, as you should remember, after 687, ANSCOM and IAEA were mandated to uh, destroy, remove, uh, or render harmless the chemical, biological weapons, ballistic missiles by ANSCOM and the IA nuclear infrastructure by the IAEA. So after all this and the revelations about South African nuclear capabilities, that they had built six nuclear warheads already, seventh was underway, then they decided on the uh, uh, eve of the transition from white minority to black majority, they decided to disarm uh, to become a non-nuclear weapon state. So b based on all these lessons learned from uh, the uh, Iraqi case, South African case and others, the IAEA initiated what is called Program 93 plus 2. The Program 93 plus 2 was actually a, a study, an internal study within the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency which aim at finding ways or suggesting ways as to how to improve the existing model protocol, as to how to come up with a more stronger document which would meet the needs of the contemporary uh, sort of uh, concerns of the international community. So, uh, and the task was, first of all, to identify the powers of the IAEA, God bless, the powers of the IAEA that were not used by the IAEA for political or technical reasons, and the additional powers that the IAEA needed in order to enhance its verification capability. So the additional protocol, this program 93 plus 2, study 93, which was expected to end in 95 within two years, and it's sometime in 96, and some revisions, some uh, uh, fine-tuning studies were conducted, and I remember in 1998, the document was finished and some time later was open to signature. But what is important or with respect to this document is that it is definitely a very powerful document, maybe not the ultimate version of one uh, might have in his hand, head in terms of how uh, a, a you know, verification mechanism or inspection document should be, but it is something which is close to the very ideal document. But what is important is uh, that we have to bear in mind that unlike model protocol, which is obligatory for the MPT states, the non-nuclear weapon states, addition protocol is not obligatory for non-nuclear weapon states to sign. It is uh, actually signed voluntarily by a number of states, including Turkey, and Turkey signed and uh, ratified the document back in 2000-2001. And uh, states who signed this document are those who want to uh, provide enough transparency and confidence to the rest of the world. Meaning that under additional protocol, there is nothing I can hide. Under, under model protocol, which is obliga obligatory, and which is still enforced uh, by many, for many states, the, it is possible to hide some of the uh, facilities as well as still in some of the facilities even if they are declared to the IAEA, it is possible to hide some of the material or some of the work that might be going on. But according to the additional protocol, if a state has signed and ratified it and therefore subject to the terms of the additional protocol with respect to the IAEA's inspections, the IAEA might go to that country, might go not only to the designated facilities but also to everywhere within the country, may, might take samples from soil, from the air, from the water, from uh, they can visit any single uh, building or any, they can go anywhere. So it is extremely difficult for a state to hide anything under additional protocol or to sort of uh, keep IAEA away from any clandestine work that might be going on. So signing and ratification of additional protocol is an indication of goodwill or the an indication of the, the intention that that particular state will not do anything wrong in the future. Because it is very likely uh, for the IAEA to detect tiny di diversion of a uh, significant amount of uh, fissile material from peaceful to military purposes. So therefore, these are uh, the issues that 
actually we should bear in mind that you know somewhere at the back because uh, the additional protocol issue has always come up uh, and, and it's still something that is being um, extensively discussed with respect to Iran's nuclear program because Iran as I said under the pressure of the IAEA Director General Mohammed al Baradei uh, with a statement that he made in February 2003 I guess and, and he gave this deadline to the Iranian authorities to sign the pro additional protocol. Otherwise, he said he would take the issue to the board and the board would most likely take the issue to the United Nations Security Council. Back then, it was not at the Security Council. Ibrahim. Can you, can you just repeat the... F they yeah. have a uh, power to uh, right uh, to remove if they found nuclear weapons or facilities. Or well, um, I mean, if they find somewhere a nuclear weapon, they would possibly call the experts or the professionals to deal with it. The, the task of the IAEA is verification of uh, uh, a country's good behavior because States that are members of the MPT, as non-nuclear weapon states, have committed themselves to never, ever even think about building nuclear weapons. So, and that was the bargain, remember. In return for not building weapons, non-nuclear um, states were promised to um, uh, sort of entertain, to enjoy, uh, to the extent possible, to the largest extent possible, the uh, uh, benefits of peaceful application of nuclear energy, right? If they don't have uh, nuclear, cap uh, nuclear energy generation capabilities, they would be allowed and they would also be given assistance uh, in getting this technology from abroad. So there will be no hindrances, no uh, uh, provocations, nothing that would um, prevent these states from using uh, nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. So, and the IAEA was given the task of verifying that states who have promised to stay non-military, I mean, or not diverting from peaceful to military purposes, verify that they are living up to their commitments. So in order to be able to verify that these states are not doing anything wrong, they have to go to these states, carry out inspections, and they must be confident that everything is according to schedule and nothing is wrong. In the case of Iran, especially after uh, this, uh, you know, Ahmadinejad came to power and, and the EU3 and the Iranian sort of uh, initiatives were just halted. There was no um, negotiations, no inspections, nothing. And, and of course, e e IAEA was carrying out its, its inspection based on the model protocol for declared facilities and in, in, in a limited fashion. And the IAEA uh, issued reports saying that they could not substantiate the uh, allegations that Iran was building weapon. I mean, they, they could not say that Iran was building a weapon, but they could not be confident that Iran was not building a weapon either. In order to be confident, in order to verify that Iran was not building a weapon, they, they were asking for carrying out many more inspections in many more places. And that was possible for a very short while, starting from November 2003, when uh, the EU3 went to Tehran, and they struck a deal with the Iranian government and the French, British, and German foreign minister when they met their Iranian counterpart, uh, and they uh, sort of suggested to Iran that it will be in the best interest of Iran if they not only signed but ratified the, the, the additional protocol. But Iranian government authorities said, look, we as the government, we can only sign the protocol as an intention of our goodwill, but it is the authority or it is the sort of a sovereign uh, uh, right of the, uh, the, the Majlis, the parliament, uh, to ratify it, so they could not do anything. And then the EU3 again 
in November 2003 suggested to their Iranian counterparts uh, ask from the government to act as if model pro additional protocol was in force, as if it was ratified. So again, as an intention of goodwill, Iranians uh, acted as if uh, additional protocol was in force and allowed the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors to visit whichever place they would like to visit. Then again, uh, the, the United States was not satisfied with that performance and was blaming the EU through initiative as something that was gaining Iran enough time to build atomic bombs. And therefore they said this is a waste of energy, a waste of time, and it is only gaining time to Iran, and the EU through initiative will not lead uh, any, anywhere, and Iran will deceive the Europeans, this and that. But of course, uh, at that time, 2004, until early 2005, and especially throughout 2004, Iranians seem to be uh, very much cooperating with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Until such time, the International Atomic Energy Agency asked for conducting uh, 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 inspections in a meter base somewhere close to Tehran, some 40 kilometers uh, away from Tehran, uh, uh, Parchin. It is a meter base and actually they wanted to carry out inspections on four of the uh, you know, specific places within the meter base. And of course the Iranians said, well, this is well uh, beyond the uh, sort of uh, authority of the IAEA. It is a meter base, there is nothing nuclear going on, so Iran, uh, IAEA does not have any authority to, to, to go there. But the IAEA insisted, and that, at that time that was toward the end of 2004, or may, maybe early 2005, I think it was in early 2005, and Iranian authorities said, all right, one time, one um, visit, or one facility. And they led the IAEA officers, indeed the director general, to pick either one of these, but just one. And that they said, whichever you pick, we will let you go. If you have any doubts about something going on, in these facilities, be careful, make your choice very well, and pick the one that you deem uh, very important. Because the United States was alleging, was sort of um, uh, blaming or accusing Iran of conducting some tests deep under the ground uh, in, 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 in this military facility, uh, tests for nuclear warheads. And of course, these tests, tests can be carried out by conventional explosives with high explosives. I mean, in order to test a warhead that you will be using in your nuclear weapon, you have to carry out some tests as to how much you know, it is resisting the blast and everything. So, and then the IAEA picked one of them, but that was to no avail because they didn't find anything. And Iran said, look, uh, you see, I mean, you use your chances and there's nothing wrong going on. But the United States and the Europeans were not truly satisfied because they said maybe it was in the other one, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the TIA has wasted its chance with this. All right, let's give a break and we'll continue afterwards. And those who want to learn uh, their uh, grace, stay here. I will read names and I will give papers and others uh, can leave. <laughs>